Okay, as you can see in today's video, we are going to go over an explanation and actually also do some example problems for the photoelectric effect. Before we get started, please don't forget, subscribe to my channel, Step-by-Step -step Science. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Click on the bell there next to the subscribe button and get notified whenever I post something new on my channel. If you would like to link to other videos that I have made for the photoelectric effect, you can do that by linking to those videos in the upper right-hand corner of this video. Okay, let's get started, photoelectric effect. Now, why do they call it the photoelectric effect? Now that is very interesting. It's called the photoelectric effect because we're going to take photons of light, particles of light that contain energy, we are going to shine them onto a surface, we're going to release electrons, and we can create an electric current with those electrons. Now those electrons are being released from that surface, as I said, from the energy that is contained within photons of light. So we're going to, in this case, going to call those electrons, or sometimes we'll talk about them as photoelectrons. It's not that they're any different than any other electron, it's just that in this case, because they're released by photons of light, we call them photoelectrons electrons. Now, if you look in a textbook, you might see a typical definition for the photoelectric effect it might be something like the emission of electrons when light is shined on the surface, on the surface of the material. And in many cases, we use metals because the valence of electrons in metals are loosely held and they can be relatively easily released from that surface or released from those atoms using the energy in photons of light to release what we call photoelectrons. Now, don't forget, in 1921, Albert Einstein, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Why did he win the Nobel Prize in Physics? Well, that is a good question. Was it for coming up with the theory of special or general relativity? No. Was it for something to do with that uh, equation E equals mc squared? No. He actually, you guessed it, won the Nobel Prize for his services to theoretical physics, and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. That's right, he won the Nobel Prize for explaining what was going on with the photoelectric effect. Now, let's just go back a little bit in time, a little bit uh, history here. It was actually in 1905 that Albert Einstein originally proposed the idea for the quantization of light energy. That was the idea that light can behave as discrete quanta, discrete packets of energy, quanta being the plural of quantum. Now we don't usually use the term quanta anymore, but that's what he usually, that's what he originally said. And the idea was that light was contained in little packets of energy. And this was kind of the idea Then we came up with the particle nature of light. There was the wave nature of light from interference patterns, and then the particle nature of light was explained from the photoelectric effect, and therefore we came up with this idea of the wave-particle duality of light. And I said we used to call these discrete packets of light, we used to call them quanta, but now more often we use the term photons, photons of light, photoelectric effect, and the energy contained within a photon of light can be described using this equation that the energy is equal to H Planck's constant times the frequency. And this equation can be used as kind of the bridge between uh, calculating the energy in photons of light and calculating the energy in a wave of light. So that's kind of the wave particle duality. And don't forget that in 1922, one year later, Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize in Physics for explaining this idea of these particles of light as an electron jumps from one energy level N1 up to another energy level N2, and that there's no kind of between step. You either go up a whole step, or you can go up two whole steps, or down one step, or down two whole steps, but you can't go up half or three quarters of a step. And that is where we came up with this idea that where there are these discrete packets of energy from particles of light, which we now call photons. Okay, before we do an example problem, I want to go over how the photoelectric effect works using this simple diagram. There's some important parts here. 
We're going to start off here with our light source. This is the light source that's going to shine photons of light onto this metal plate. If those photons of light have enough energy, then they will release electrons from that plate, and we're going to call that plate the cathode, where the electrons are going to come from. The electrons will move across this space over here to this plate, and they're going to be added to this plate, so we're going to call that the anode. All right. If we can release photoelectrons, then we'll set up a current through this circuit, and we can measure the current strength using this ammeter, and we have this variable voltage source here, which we'll talk about later. Okay, now we're gonna turn the light source on. We're gonna shine a photon of light or photons of light onto this metal plate. This is a photon of light. In this case, I have red light. You remember red light has a relatively long wavelength, a low frequency and low energy, but the energy within a photon of light can be described using this equation that energy is equal to h times f, Planck's constant times the frequency. And this photon of light will be absorbed by this metal plate. Now, this is a specific kind of metal. It might be sodium, it might be silver, it might be potassium, cesium, but every metal has a different amount of energy that is needed to release electrons from its surface. That amount of energy that is needed to release electrons from its surface is called the work function, W0. This is the symbol that I'm going to use for the work function. You will see different symbols for the work function, but I'm going to use this symbol, and the work function is the minimum amount of energy needed to liberate an electron from that surface. Now, red light, as we said, has relatively low energy, so in this case, if the energy contained within that photon of light is less than the work function, then no photoelectrons will be released. So in this case, red didn't have enough energy. Sometimes for some materials, it might have en enough energy, but in this case, we're gonna say that it didn't. So we're gonna turn up the energy, so to speak, and we're going to use green light. Now, if you remember something about the electromagnetic spectrum, and specifically about the visible spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, the color of the rainbow. When you go from red to blue across the visible spectrum, you're decreasing the wavelength and increasing the energy. So green light has more energy than red light. So we're just going to say that that light is going to be, or that energy is therefore going to be absorbed again. And if the energy contained within that green light, which can be calculated as HF, if it's more than the work function, then we're going to be producing photoelectrons. Now, if it's more than the work function, then there's, in a sense, some energy left over. So we produce a photoelectron, and the, that electron will carry that extra energy away from that plate and it will give that electron some kinetic energy, okay? So there's three important things. There's the energy of the photon, which we can calculate as HF. There's the work function, which is the energy needed to release an electron from that surface. And if there is extra energy from the photon left over after you have gone through the work function, then that electron can carry some of that or, or will carry that energy away in the form of kinetic energy. Now, there is an equation that we use for the photoelectric effect that describes the relationship between the kinetic energy, the energy of light, and the work function, and that is this equation right here. This is the important equation. It says that the kinetic energy of the photon that has been released from this plate is equal to energy in the photon of light. Now we don't write E in here. When you look in a textbook, you'll see it's HF. I don't know why they don't put an E, they just put HF, but that's how you calculate E. So the kinetic energy is equal to the energy in the photon of light minus the work function. So I kind of think about this is like the total amount of energy that the system starts with. Some of the energy is used to reach the work function, and if there's extra energy left over, then that energy will be given to the electron in the form of kinetic energy. All right, so that is how the photoelectric effect works. Shine light, if there's enough energy, 
then the extra energy will be given to the uh, electron in the form of kinetic energy. All right, so this is the problem we're going to be going over for the photoelectric phase. It says that monochromatic light with a wavelength of 450 nanometers is incident shined on a sodium surface. The work function for sodium is 2.36 electron volts, and we want to know what is the kinetic energy and the velocity of those photoelectrons that are being released from that sodium. Now, before I like to get started with the calculations, I'd like to just make a little picture. Help me get organized, collect my thoughts, take a minute. There's my sodium circuit. I just draw a line. It has a work function of 2.36 electron volts, as it says in the problem. We have incident light, which has a wavelength of 450 nanometers. We're going to hopefully get some photoelectrons out of that. We want to know what's their kinetic energy going to be and their velocity. Here's the equation that we're going to use. The kinetic energy is equal to HF, the energy in that light, minus the work function. The leftover energy will be carried off by those electrons in the form of velocity and kinetic energy. Okay, we can start now. Now, I just want to point out that this problem, of course, involves some physics, but also involves a lot of math and kind of converting back and forth. So you got to keep all this stuff straight in your head. And the first problem is that the work function is given in energy. And we have to take the energy in the light and subtract them at the work function. Well, the energy in the light is not given in energy. It's given in wavelength in nanometers. In order to subtract these two values, we have to have like units. Well, the work function is in units, electron volts. That's one of the units for energy, just like joule is the, one of the other more common units for energy. So because we have energy electron volts here, we have a different unit here. We're going to have to convert, so to speak, this 450 nanometers into electron volts. And we're going to do that like this using these two equations. First, it says the energy is equal to H Planck's constant times the frequency. We don't know the frequency. We know the wavelength. But we can use this equation also that says C, the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Solve this equation for the frequency, and that gives you that the frequency is equal to C divided by the wavelength, lambda being the symbol for the wavelength, C being the symbol for the speed of light in a vacuum. Substitute this equation into this equation, and you get that the energy is equal to HC divided by the wavelength. But one other problem is that the wavelength is given in nanometers, and in order to put it into this equation, it has to be in meters. 450 nanometers, we can convert into meters like this because we know that one meter is equal to a billion nanometers. So we take this value, multiply by this value, divide by this value, and you get 4.50 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Voila. Now we can plug everything in. We get H Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times the speed of light in a vacuum C, which is 3.0 times 10 to 8 meters per second, divided by the wavelength, 4.50 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, yields energy at 4.42 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. You can see here the meters cancel, the seconds cancel, we're left with joules. We have energy, but this energy is in electron volts, this energy is in joules, so we still can't plug everything in until we convert this energy in joules into electron volts. And we know that one electron volt is equal to 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So we're going to take this value, multiply by this value, divide by this value, joules cancel, we're left over with 2.76 electron volts. That is the energy contained in light that has this wavelength, 450 nanometers. Okay, we converted first from nanometers to meters to joules and then to electron volts. Now, you should notice that the incoming light has 2.76 electron joules of electron volts of energy, which is more than the work function, 0.4 more. So that tells us that we're going to have uh, photoelectrons. Those photoelectrons are going to have some velocity. They're going to have some kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy we have is going to be the difference between the incoming energy, 276, and the work function, the minimum amount of energy needed to release an electron, and that's 2.36 electron volts, kinetic energy, 0.4 electron volts. Okay, 
Now, we also want to know the velocity. Now, in order to get the velocity, we're going to have to use the kinetic energy equation, which is that one half mv squared is equal to the kinetic energy. We're going to looking for velocity. This is the velocity. We're going to rearrange this equation to solve for the velocity. The velocity is therefore equal to the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy divided by the mass of the electron, which we'll tell you about in just a moment. How did I get this? If I have this equation, I can multiply both sides by 2. It gets rid of the 1 half over here. Divide by m, moves the m over here, take the square root. The velocity is equal to 2 times Ke divided by m and take the square root. Now, I cannot put electron volts in this equation. The only thing I can put in this equation is joules. So now I'm going to have to take this electron volt and convert it into joules. And 0.4 electron volts, I know that once again that one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And that tells me that this many electron volts is equal to this many joules, which now I can put that into this equation. Velocity is equal to the square root of 2, because here's a 2. The kinetic energy, we just calculated up here in joules, 6.40 times 10 to the minus 20 joules, divided by the mass of an electron, which is kind of small, at 9.1 or 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. 2 times this divided by that, take the square root, and you get that the velocity of the photoelectrons when this wavelength of light is shined on this surface Giving the electrons this much kinetic energy will give them this velocity, 3.75 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Okay, that was fun. Thanks for watching. I hope you found that video helpful. We went over an explanation of the photoelectric effect, and then we did that awesome example. If you found that video helpful, please do all of the following four things. Support my channel, Step by Step Science. Um, subscribe, get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Give me a thumbs up for this video. Leave me a nice positive comment in the comment section below, please. Those things help me out a lot. Take some time. And don't forget, sharing is caring. Share be with all of your friends, show them just how much you care. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.